Hello and welcome to today's edition of Velocity Kinetics. Today we're talking about the inevitability of Max Verstappen in F1. I am sporting my Red Bull gear, just whilst one of my cats is outside. Georgie! Do his thing. But obviously there's been a lot of complaints in F1 at the moment that Max Verstappen is winning everything. And that Red Bull are winning everything. There's no easy way to fix it. Technically there isn't a fix. Because someone will always get the rules right. So, what do we do? How do we do it? And, do we care? So just whilst I finish off my working day, as in there's only a few minutes left and there's not much at the moment to do, but everything could suddenly go awry, um, what can F1 do to stop stop the inevitability of Max Verstappen or fix, fix itself? Now, the main issue in F1, and this is regardless of team, driver, rule set, etc., one team, at least, let me rephrase, in what we would describe as modern F1, so I would say, what, late 80s onwards? Sort of, yeah, maybe 87, 88 area onwards. One team masters the rules, and the rest are playing catch-up. So, look at the McLaren MP44s, it's a, uh, a MP, early MP4 cars, like the MP44 all dominating one fifteen out of 16 races you've got the williams um you've got red five which is what fw14 you had fw15 you had fws uh you had fw uh what was it that yeah that damon hill won i believe fw18 was the chassis sorry my phone is doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things on its case trying to get it just to prop itself up and it is just deciding it is kind of deciding it has had enough so i've had to move my phone because it was constantly trying to fall over and i think it's going to do the same again so you know you got fw18 fw19 dominating everything then you had the mclaren versus ferrari battle in the late 90s you had williams threatening to do more dominating with the bmw engine as in if they Let's put it bluntly, if they sorted their shit out, they could have dominated with what sort of beast they had in the back of that engine. Um, yeah, then had the domination of Schumacher. Um, and then when they uh, changed the rules, you then saw Braun begin to dominate. And had Braun slash Honda, if Honda had got it right, because I've seen some debate online. Some people reckon that whilst the Braun car was really good, it was greatly flattered by a Mercedes engine. There are question marks over what it would have been like with a Honda engine, as in, would the weight balance have been off? Would it have blown a diffuser? Would it have just been an absolute all-conquering monster? It's sort of one of the great what-ifs um, of F1. But you had Braun and Red Bull dominate, then Red Bull dominated for a while, then Mercedes got the rules right for the turbos and have pretty much dominated. And then it looked like at the start of the new rules, that Ferrari were going to dominate, at least based on testing times, and then it turns out it's Red Bull that are dominating. We did see, particularly in 2021, that because there was very little left for the, for, for the top teams to improve on, this is not to say that likes of Mercedes had, and Ferrari and Red Bull had stopped innovating, because that is a million miles from the case, they were still continuing to innovate and push the boundaries of what they could and couldn't do at that time. We began to see convergence. We began to see teams closing that gap. Um, the only way more improvements could happen would have been the likes if Williams, Alfa Romeo, Aston Martin suddenly stumbled on the right formula and, and, and made a ton of progress. Although technically possible, realistically, I don't think so. You've then got the likes of 
the midfield, how much change they can make. You've got teams like what was Racing Point, now Aston Martin, um, changing their tack and copying the most common design. We got that now with the side pods. Everyone went, had Mercedes with their size zero concept, which regardless of whether it worked or not, I'm not going to get into that because I don't, I don't understand enough about it. As I understand the theory was right, as in make the package narrow, minimise its hole in the air, but then parts of it just didn't work, as in there was not the weight and it, the other bits caused too much turbulence. But the fact that you have, you had a top team coming out with, with a zero side pod concept. You've got Ferrari with their concept. You've got Aston Martin merging all concepts. But everyone seems to have merged the Red Bull. Big undercut. Small inlet. The only exception would be Alpha Tower. Because they used a Honda unit. They would more than likely stumble upon the same solution anyway. Assuming it's not a solution that was driven by Honda. Now some people are saying that these rules, this rule set has failed. And yes and no it has and hasn't. The rule set has failed in the sense of people have gone back to generating too much downforce. They found a way to make outwash again, which was part of the problem. Apologise for the frames all over the place. I'm having, I've done a very high-tech method of propping my phone up on its weird-shaped case uh, on top of a jar that has... Well, an old jam jar that has paper clips in it now on top of a note, notebook and using my computer screen to stop my phone falling backwards. But there we are, and just kind of keep an eye on my work, where it should be done. But just need final confirmation because something happened in the last few minutes. But anyway, as I mentioned, one team will always get it right. That's just it. So, but what can F1 do? And as we, as I mentioned before, my phone fell backwards. Teams have found a way to generate the outwash and the um. And more downforce so it seems that people are saying that these rules have failed and not really they haven't really failed that much in my opinion now they were supposed to deliver closer on track racing easier overtakes but it didn't count on the fia monkeying around with things like drs zones and things now, I can understand that they don't want an overtake just to be done on that straight and leave it alone. For example, can you remember Alonso in Bahrain in the Aston Martin overtaking places that you would not normally overtake? But he was doing it rather than using the DRS zones. You want to encourage overtaking in other places on the track. So it is an interesting race. End of discussion. Um, but overtaking as P1 with Matt and Tommy put it on the bait on the back of monaco isn't the be all and end all because sometimes you just need a mixed up order like alpine getting third esteban ocon probably could not hope could not hope for third in a lot of racetracks there are some places that alpine has looked mighty good and likewise with gasly gasly could potentially hope for a podium at some circuits but not all of them because the aston martin's so strong mercedes look like they're on a comeback in the Ferrari, don't discount them, because when they get that car, it does look like it's got a re reasonably good package. It just seems to be constantly boiling down to Ferrari. I suppose you could call it polish. The underlying theories are all correct. It's just their execution that hasn't quite been quite been on it. And when they suss that out, Leclerc slash Sainz, if you believe the Hamilton rumour, um, which would be nice, I suppose, because... I'm not his biggest fan, but I would like to see him in something other than a Mercedes or in a car that has something other than Mercedes power. I know it's a brilliant brand and they've got a lot of clout in F1. But for me, I just like to see him do something. Just want to see him do something, uh, something different. The, the issue is last year looked really good. And then this year to resolve some of the bouncing, the porpoising, they raised the floor, tweet and made a couple of tweaks. Which seems to have now meant these cars are just bloody insane. I know some people would say that you could just easily revert back to last year's floor specification. But that bouncing is not healthy. And could potentially lead to spinal problems, nerve damage, even brain damage. Because you're not meant to be shaken around like that to that to that degree. What F1 can do is is a bit of a mystery. 
as I see it, and this is just my perspective as an armchair enthusiast, the only things I can see are that are the best things to do is somehow control the amount of outwash that the teams are generating. So the flick ups and flaps that send the air sideways, I would say they need to find a way to to, to minimise that even more, even just outlaw it. And I would say the other thing, at least for now, because these cars are still going through evolution, is just to leave everything alone. So by that I mean seeing how the races pan out under the old DRS zones and things like that. If it, uh, and if this year, say for instance, I'm trying to think of it, if they mess with the DRS zones at Silverstone, for example, if they decide, no, we're going to shorten it by 20 metres, 50 metres, that might upset the balance of, of decent racing. If they decided, but if if off the back of, of leaving it where they are for this year, if it's only a case of like, well, this is like China 2016. It's now, it, We've now got a world record number of overtakes in a Grand Prix. Then fine, that, that's, that's wrong. The other thing I would say that they should do is I think too many drivers are driving to a delta. So the delta is a set time that drivers need to hit. It's not just for things like wave, uh, yellow flags, double waved, yellows, virtual safety car and things. To maximise tyre performance and minimise time lost in the pits, drivers will be set a time to drive to to maximise the tyre life. There'll be so many laps that they can push on them, especially if um, they're in uh, in the front or at second, third, and it looks like it's reasonable. But there's no... At times, there's just no attacking. You're relying on the midfield to generate the action. And it's criminal, in my opinion, that you've got a car, you've got one car being driven... So it could, well, and some, well, and sometimes two, with when Perez is on it, you've got two cars potentially being driven. So they're so far ahead of the field. Now, I appreciate some might say yes, but if you took Red Bull out of the equation, you'd be saying the same about Aston Martin. It's like, but the gap from Aston Martin in second or third down to third or fourth, depending on who is which team has finished there, is not as big. As first, second, as first is to second, or second is to third, depending on the one-two scenario. In fact, if you look at it, sometimes some of the better races have happened when Perez has been further back and come through the field. The Red Bull has has been designed in quite a good way. Well, it's not quite. It, it's been designed in a brilliant way. Previous Mercedes, when they were dominating, were designed in such a way that they had to qualify on pole. Otherwise, they couldn't get past. And older Red Bulls had that same problem. They just, once they were in traffic, that was it. They were absolutely knackered. They had to be running in clear air. Whether this has been an, in, an intentional move by Red Bull or just a coincidental one is another thing altogether. But their car is designed in such a way that it can run in traffic and it can run in clear air. In fact, it's an absolute beast in clear air. But is it a byproduct? Is the car that superior? It doesn't matter what traffic's in front of it. It's just going to get through. I have no idea. The main thing, I think, is to stop one-stop races. And this isn't just a thing to get on at Verstappen or, 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 or whoever. If, if suddenly Alonso goes on absolute tear. It's not to stop or peg back anyone like that. But we need drivers driving the wheels off their car. We need it to be that someone's doing a one-stop that's just then throwing a curveball, not the norm. Like, uh, was it Australia last year where Alex Albon did nearly the entire race on one set of tyres and basically came in to make his mandatory stop and then and then um, managed to score a point. Well, I don't think I'm needed anymore today, so I am shutting down. It's quarter past five, work finished at five. Set some bloody boundaries. But that should have been a curveball. That should have been Williams trying something different. But the one stop shouldn't be shouldn't be the go to. So now there's a lot of call for, and I think it's quite a good idea, really. There's been a lot of call, and I remember even Mark Priestley calling for this on his vlog a couple of years ago now, 
make it so the teams must use every compound of tyre in the race. So you could have someone going really long on a set of hards, then a, sh a short rapid fire stint on the mediums, and then a short, an even shorter lightning stint on the softs. You could have it the other way around, where people are going to make up as many positions as they can on the softs, then continue to make up more ground on the mediums, and then just cruise to cruise to cruise to the end on hards. That and then introduces an element of strategy because you can have some people if they're that confident they can get all the way to the end on on some hards. They could even do their first two stops in the first two laps if they really felt the need to. Obviously, then there's the complication of well, where do you stand if the rain falls? I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, no, I, I I don't disagree with that additional complication. I do also feel though, when the safety car comes out, a lot of a lot of drivers are robbed of hard work they've managed to do. And I'm, I'm very conflicted on this. I do remember years ago that F1 used to close the pit lane when the safety car came out. And it caused a lot of problems in the set. But the, the problem they had then, though, is they, would, they would, were doing refueling. So cars coming, cars coming, wants to come in were on bingo fuel. And that shouldn't be a case of that they have to lose out because a car crashed and they can't go in the pits. But maybe would they should explore stopping people being able to change their tyres and things during during a um, safety car. They should only be able to repair, come in for accident damage. So say, for instance, if one car has, has tapped another, it's flipped, safety car's got to come out to get that, recover it, because help slow everything down for recovery, as in it's re gone over in such a way that they can still keep going, doesn't need a red flag. The car that's done the flipping, assuming it's not disqualified or not out itself, if it's just somehow managed to just break its front wing, they're allowed into repair crash damage, i.e. get that fixed and and sort that out. And likewise, if a car thinks it's driven through debris, or they have driven through debris, and their teams can prove that there's a slow puncture, then they could come in at that point. There's so many different ways that this could go, and you could think of all sorts of rules. For it, the one additional there, there is two additional things I want to sort of say, because I could probably ramble. Ramble is probably the best way to put it, because I do these when I do these vlogs. I don't come in with much thought of what I'm going to say. I just have my point and sort of let my brain wander. That's the way velocity kinetics is always. Actually, not always. I did used to have some points on a pen. Uh, uh, points on a pen. Points on a notepad. But even then, that was just a caterum and then nothing else it was like two or three words that was it nothing nothing more than uh, nothing more than that one thing i think f1 should consider and i'm sure i've mentioned this before as velocity kinetics and if i didn't mention it as velocity kinetics i mentioned it when pure racing fuel wasn't our podcast name it was when it was my own blog or i may have even mentioned it when i was writing for net cars way back when f1 should maybe consider going to a ballast style championship so if a car is just so far ahead and is dominating then they should have a weight penalty a success penalty if if you if you want to call it that now i know some people would argue well that's not fair because the engineers would say well it's not my it's not my fault that the um that the other teams haven't designed a very good car and in many ways you, you, you there is a valid point but even if it just may even if it's still Verstappen and the Red Bull, or the Red Bulls, always winning, but the gap is cut down from 40 seconds down to 10. That is at least better for the viewer. And it's cheap. It is a cheap way to do it. So, the problem is, is where do you stop? Because obviously those F1 cars are designed with such small tolerances in them, if suddenly slapping an extra 10 kilos of weight in a part of the car suddenly makes it act like a pendulum on every corner, it, it's uh, a problem. But maybe there is becomes a point in the car where the FIA could add ballast. So say, for instance, down the centre line, near the plank, there's a square... I don't know. Say, for instance, because, just because it's this thing I've got close to hand, my, my work notebook, or one of my many work notebooks, I've got them everywhere... Say they've got a space about as big as this, which is what, A5 size, give or take? 
to have a space that big in the car that's just an empty space normally and then if success comes in then that is where your ballast goes so when you're designing and testing you test it with it fully loaded up with ballast and you test it with it removed that is a cheap way to to, to potentially bring it bring everything back into line the increments is another thing that would need to be decided the maximum weight would need to be decided and then at what point do you introduce it because you could using braun as an example winning six out of the first seven races you could say to the braun team right well we're going to introduce you've got a, a, a five kilogram weight increment because of your success but at that same time, the brawn suddenly went off kilter. It sort sort of never quite enjoyed the rest of that level that that, that level of success in the winning to that degree for the rest of the season. It scored plenty of points, podiums. It did score a couple more wins with with Rubens, and did ultimately win the championship. But it even as Jensen said on comms i believe it was silverstone how would this car gone from being so lovely two weeks ago to being as difficult to drive as it is now you just need unfavorable conditions for one car it needs to be a bit hotter a bit colder and suddenly you could say to max verstappen right your car's now getting a 10 kilogram weight penalty because of because of the success go to what's up next barcelona just need a headwind in the wrong direction. That Red Bull could be completely upset. And then, boom, he's lost his weight, lost the weight penalty because of not doing very well. Or just need an engine blowout and a retirement. Boom, he's lost the weight penalty. Back to normal, back to dominating. So it's not a, a completely flawless rule, but it is a cheap rule to implement. The other thing that I was going to say is I don't think at any other time in formula one history that we have had so many good drivers on the grid and i'm not just meaning world championship drivers as in people who could win races who have won races nearly won races so obviously you've got the obvious ones of max verstappen multiple world champion lewis hamilton multiple world champion alonso multiple world champion You've got you've got those you got them just there. You've got Esteban Ocon race wi race winner. You have got Pierre Gasly race winner. George Russell race winner. Sergio Perez. I should have said him. Sergio Perez multiple race winner. And then you've got people who've just sat on the podium. So you've got uh, you've got Lando Norris who's been on the podium quite a few times. Albon been on the podium quite a few times. You've got. Stroll, who's been on the podium a few times. Now, Stroll, I've got an asterisk next to because I, because I blow hot and cold on Stroll. One minute he does something that's like, yes, he deserves his place. The next, it's like, just just walk out the back door quietly. You've got Valtteri Bottas, multiple race winner, multiple podium, podium finisher. You've got a lot of drivers who could be world champions in the right machinery. And you've also got, obviously, the Ferrari pairing, Charles Leclerc and uh, Carlos Sainz. You know, you've got loads of people who have won races and podium and sat on podiums. You've got, and you've just got people who've just got a lot of talent and circumstance have gone against them, such as K-Mag. The Haas has been against him a few times, but if the Haas had been as good as uh, able to race in the positions that he's qualified in times, at times over the years, he'd be a multiple podium sitter, uh, podium visitor now, not just, a, not just P2. The Hulk. He should, in, the in theory, be a is it at least a two-time race winner by now, based on the teams he's driven for and a multi and multiple podiums he should have to his name. It's we've got, like I say, we've got so much talent on the grid now, and then the young talent that we've got, some of the young talent that's showing some promise. You've got obviously Piastri showing, uh, showing a lot of promise, and who's come up very highly rated. Joe, even though he's paid for his seat. If there was no talent behind it, no matter how big the paycheck is, someone somewhere would say, look, you could you could write me a check for a billion dollars. You're so bad at racing. I don't want my brand associated with it. And he be, wouldn't be there. Or uh, Logie Sarge, Lo, you know, Logan Sargent, if he he could be better, not going to lie, he 
Now, of, out of who was available, he was not my choice of driver for Williams. Not by any stretch of the imagination. But he's shown talent on the way up. And potentially with the right car, he would do that. De Vries, another one. Sonoda, another one. Otherwise, he wouldn't be wouldn't have gotten the Alpha Tauri seat. If you put everyone in the same car on the grid, if everyone, say, pick a midfield car, Alpine. If Alpine produced, if Alpine produced 20 cars... You'd be, I'd be I would be willing to bet that the field would be incredibly close by the time it finished. There would not be many stragglers, not in, not count not factoring in technical errors and um, setup. If they're all set up identically, same conditions, it would be very very close. So I'm going to wrap up this episode here. So ultimately, what can F1 do? There's not a lot they can do without. Without making a mess. The short answers would be. Remove any way for the cars to make outwash. Consider going. Ba ballast based championship. But we have to remember. The sheer calibre of drivers we've got on the grid. Not anything we've ever seen in F1 before. Or at least not for a very long time. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, stay tuned for some future content. Um, I believe I've got two or three videos in the pipeline at this point by the time this goes out i'm hoping future me has thought of further things to put out um but drive safe look after yourselves and we'll see you next time around <laughs>